Hey guys, welcome to my channel and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. On an early August morning in 2015, emergency services received a call. Tom Martins, the caller, urgently reported a violent altercation involving his daughter and son-in-law. He's bloodied and I fear I might have killed him, Tom revealed with a shaken voice. In response, the dispatcher quickly mobilized medical support. The phone was then passed to Tom's distraught daughter, skilled in CPR. The dispatcher calmly instructed, Stay composed. Rely on your training, not emotions. We need to revive your husband. Ready to start CPR? Meanwhile, first responders rushed to the upscale neighborhood in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They arrived at a $350,000 home, noted for its stylish gray shutters and well-maintained lawns, only to find Jason Corbett brutally murdered. This incident unfolds a tragic narrative of a widower with two young children, who was in dire need of emotional support after losing his cherished wife. It also introduces a young woman, seeming like a beacon of hope, who stepped in to care for the children. Yet, it serves as a stark reminder of the dangers of hastily integrating almost strangers into close-knit family bonds. If Jason had been fully aware of Molly's mental health background and had known her more intimately, he might have reconsidered her close involvement with his kids. For Molly, meeting Jason symbolized a fresh start, complete with a loving family and the children she always dreamt of. However, for Jason, this relationship tragically became a one-way journey with no return. Molly Martin's life was the epitome of the American dream. Born into a wealthy and educated white family, she enjoyed a prosperous upbringing in Farragut, Tennessee. Her early years were spent in a luxurious mansion, where she was the cherished little princess. Neighbors recall her as a reserved, somewhat introverted girl, who was an adept swimmer despite frequent health-related absences from school. With the family's move to the more lavish Fox Run area, Molly continued her education at Farragut High School, participating in the swim team. Though not as skilled as her peers, Molly still felt like a champion in her own world. Molly's mother, Sharon, a math doctorate from the prestigious Emory University in Georgia, and her father, Tom, an FBI agent and seasoned lawyer, instilled a family motto. Success is measured only by achievements, regardless of whether they were real or perceived. The Martenses were known as pillars of society, a family striving for prestige, wealth, and perfect heirs, ready to continue their lifestyle. From a young age, the children were raised with a win-at-all-costs mentality. The main issue was that Molly, the beloved daughter and little princess, didn't live up to these high expectations, unlike her two brothers. To maintain their societal facade, Tom and Sharon went to great lengths to conceal why. Molly was perceived as frequently ill, with a supposed issue in her left foot causing her pain and requiring numerous hospitalizations and surgeries. In reality, it wasn't a physical ailment that kept Molly from school, but her mental health. To preserve their external image, Tom and Sharon kept their daughter's issues within the family, with few knowing what happened behind the closed doors of their luxurious mansion. Thanks to her parents' influence, Molly seemingly secured a spot at Clemson, one of America's top colleges. In 2003, her photograph appeared in the Clemson University yearbook as a freshman, but then records of her disappeared. In 2004, Molly began working at the Visage Beauty Salon in Knoxville, where she met stylist Jeremy Taylor. The two started dating and spent a year and a half together. Despite their closeness, Taylor only knew about Molly's leg health issues, necessitating numerous surgeries and often preventing her from working. Yet, he admired her dancing and ballet talents, never questioning the intense strain on her foot. After breaking up with Taylor, Molly joined a dating site where she started a romantic correspondence with Keith McGinn. On February 22, 2007, nearly a year before meeting the widowed father of two, Keith and Molly went on their first date. It was to Keith that Molly first revealed her bipolar disorder and some other accompanying issues. Keith, who suffered from chronic fatigue and depression himself, supported her and moved in with her a month later. Molly found work as a nanny, attended therapy, and things seemed to be going well. The fairy tale ended when she contracted a severe staph infection. 
The medication for the infection interfered with her bipolar medication, leading to a drastic change in her behavior. According to Keith, at one point, Molly was taking 16 pills prescribed by her psychiatrist daily, plus an additional 10 as needed. Most of these were for her bipolar disorder and manic depressive psychosis. Molly stopped sleeping, and their relationship rapidly deteriorated. In a bid to save their relationship, Molly decided to get pregnant. She always said that children would make her happy, Keith later revealed in an interview. Eventually, she got pregnant. I was terrified because I knew how many medications she was on. I was really scared. On September 16, 2007, Molly miscarried early in the pregnancy. Keith recalled, she was devastated. But honestly, I was relieved. I thought it was for the best. Five months later, in February 2008, with no improvement in her condition, Molly was admitted to a psychiatric unit in a medical rehabilitation center in Atlanta, Georgia. Her parents paid for the treatment. A few days after her discharge, she told Keith, I want to go work as a nanny somewhere in Europe. He took it as a sign of her relapsing and didn't think much of her online advertisement seeking a nanny position. However, she soon informed him that she had found a job in Ireland and would be leaving for a while. Her advertisement was answered by Jason Corbett, unaware of the future nanny's troubles. Jason Corbett was born on February 12, 1976, in Limerick, Ireland. He grew up in a happy and caring family. His parents, John and Rita, raised eight children, including Jason's twin brother, Wayne. The family valued emotional richness over material wealth, and despite financial struggles after their father lost his job, they strived to provide a nurturing environment for the children. To help out, Jason took a part-time job as a security guard at a school sports center. He was eager to earn money to delight his loved ones. Work ethic and the desire to support those around him were always important values for Jason, making him a favorite among family and friends. Margaret Fitzpatrick, or simply Meg, was one of those who had a deep affection for Jason. Right after meeting, they knew they were meant for each other. Married, they eagerly started planning a family, both desiring a large, happy household. In September 2004, they welcomed their first child, Jack, and two years later, their daughter Sarah was born. Meg and Jason felt true happiness raising their little ones, deeply loving each other and their children, and everything in their life seemed perfect. However, this idyllic life came to an abrupt end. On November 21, 2006, just three months after Sarah's birth, tragedy struck. Meg woke up with an asthma attack and, despite medical intervention, passed away in the hospital. Her death left 30-year-old Jason in profound grief. In his loneliness and sorrow, only his love for his children kept him afloat. His relatives supported him, understanding the importance of being there for him during this difficult time. Humble and kind, Jason felt uneasy about relying so much on his family for help and childcare. This thought troubled Jason. He didn't want to be a burden, although his family never saw him that way. In 2007, he decided to hire a housekeeper. The first candidate, a Czech woman, didn't click with Jason, so he let her go. Then he hired a Spanish woman, but the language barrier posed problems. Both women were looking for temporary work, not willing to stay in Ireland long term, which frustrated Jason, who sought a reliable long term helper. He eventually concluded that the best solution would be to find an English speaking nanny seeking long term employment. In early February 2008, he emailed 20 year old Molly Martins. She sent a resume that, as it would later emerge, contained inaccuracies. Molly claimed she had graduated from Clemson University, although she had actually dropped out. She also stated she had been approved as a foster parent, which was not true. She made no mention of her recent psychiatric hospitalization or her mental health issues. Jason thought he had finally found the nanny he was looking for. The prospective housekeeper agreed to move to Ireland and care for the children. She was living in Knoxville, Tennessee, and flew to Ireland on March 10, 2008. The plan hit a snag right away. At customs, Molly faced difficulties due to her one-way ticket, raising issues with immigration services. She couldn't explain how long she would stay in the country and didn't have a work visa. However, she managed to resolve these issues and was allowed entry. 
After living in Ireland for two weeks, the cheerful American called Keith and informed him that she wouldn't be returning. They broke up over the phone. The children, Sarah and Jack, quickly grew fond of their new nanny and loved her. Jason was happy to see life stabilizing. Molly took good care of the children, giving Jason peace of mind. Over time, their relationship grew closer, and Jason started inviting the nanny out on dates. Jason and Molly, who began their relationship under unusual circumstances, faced challenges. The initial honeymoon phase quickly gave way to reality. However, Jason, recognizing the situation's imperfections, reassured himself with Molly's skillful interaction with his children. The couple got engaged in 2010. Jason loved his new partner, and importantly, he believed his children had also grown to love the caring Molly. After their engagement, Molly suggested moving to America, longing for her homeland. Understanding that the children would miss Molly, Jason agreed. A year later, he transferred to a factory in Lexington, North Carolina, and sold his house in Ireland. That same year, they married in a grand ceremony in Molly's hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. Molly's father, Tom Martins, walked her down the aisle, while little Jack and Sarah played the roles of ring bearer and flower girl. Jason bought a luxurious home in a popular neighborhood, complete with an 18-hole golf course, club, pool, tennis courts, playgrounds, and parks. He paid $58,350 in cash for the house. The peculiarities began during the wedding celebration itself. For some reason, Molly told her friends that she and Meg, Jason's first wife, had been friends before Meg died of cancer. However, Meg had passed away in 2006 when Molly was not acquainted with Jason and couldn't have known his wife. Meg's death was due to a respiratory illness, not cancer. Regrettably, the happy groom didn't pay much attention to these conversations. Years passed, and the family continued their life in North Carolina. Jason joined the local golf club and became active in the community while Molly worked as a swimming coach. Men were drawn to Jason for his friendliness, and women admired Molly's baking skills and supermodel figure. They appeared to be the perfect couple, an attractive and sociable husband, a well-groomed and athletic wife. They were the most in-love couple you ever saw, always holding hands, always kissing and laughing. They just seemed very, very happy, a neighbor would later say. Molly had been conditioned since childhood to maintain a prestigious facade for the public, no matter what was happening behind closed doors. In reality, the marriage was fraught with difficulties. Jason resisted Molly's persistent attempts to adopt his two children. While it seemed a normal desire for a woman who had stepped into the role of mother, her insistence became so intense and obsessive that it started to frighten Jason. According to his sister, Molly convinced neighbors she was the biological mother of the children and even described her pregnancy with Sarah to acquaintances. The couple constantly argued over the adoption issue. Jason felt unhappy, longing for his home, missing his friends, and the warm family evenings with his brothers and sisters. He seriously considered divorce and returning to Ireland with his son and daughter, which he honestly discussed with Molly. Her reaction was immediate and intensely emotional. After the argument, Jason even hid the children's passports, fearing that Molly might dispose of them to prevent their departure. The more he contemplated divorce, the more desperately she tried to keep him and the children with her. Jason lost his zest for life and began to gain a significant amount of weight, which infuriated his young wife. A husband with excess weight disrupted their perfect public image. The night before the murder, the couple attended a dinner at a neighbor's house, where Molly loudly criticized the amount of food on Jason's plate in front of all the guests. She openly stated that it was unacceptable for someone of his weight to eat so much. Jason left silently. The following night, August 2nd, 2015, Molly and her father beat Jason to death. On August 1st, Molly's parents, Tom and Sharon, arrived in North Carolina for a visit. The exact purpose of this visit remains a mystery to this day. Some believe Molly and her father pre-planned the visit to ensure Tom was present to assist in committing the crime, while others see it as a routine parental visit. Since Tom and Sharon arrived late in the evening, they decided to give the gifts they brought for the children the next morning. This detail is crucial. They had prepared an aluminum baseball bat for Jack and were planning to give Sarah a tennis racket. 
After dinner, Tom and Sharon retired to the guest bedroom in the basement. Molly and Jason went to their bedroom on the first floor, and the children went upstairs to their respective rooms on the second floor. According to Molly, Sarah woke her up at 3 a.m. after a nightmare. Molly calmed her down and took her back to bed. By the time she returned, Jason, she claimed, was awake and furiously angry, leading to a fight that ultimately resulted in his death. As the supposed altercation began, Tom, a former FBI agent, allegedly heard strange noises from his daughter and son-in-law's bedroom. Concerned, he grabbed the baseball bat intended for Jack and headed to the room. Upon entering, he claimed to see Jason choking Molly. Jason, noticing his father-in-law, tightened his grip and dragged Molly to the bathroom, threatening to kill her. Tom pleaded with Jason to release Molly, but seeing his requests were futile, he intervened to save his daughter. Tom stated that his initial bat strike didn't stop Jason from strangling Molly, so he continued to hit him. Eventually, Jason released Molly, attempting to grab the bat. A struggle ensued, with Jason wrenching the bat away and knocking Tom to the floor. Tom claimed Molly, in a state of extreme fear, grabbed a brick from the bedside table and struck Jason on the head. Both father and daughter, fearing for their lives, continued to attack the enraged man until they realized he was no longer a threat. By calling the rescue service, Tom described the incident as a fight where his son-in-law had assaulted his daughter, and now Jason urgently needed help. However, when emergency services arrived, the scene indicated something far more brutal than simple self-defense. The bedroom walls and floor were drenched in blood, with splatters also on the ceiling and furniture. Jason's skull was so shattered that pieces of his scalp were scattered across the floor. The medical examiner noted in the report that the number of blows was impossible to determine as pieces of skull fell onto the table during the autopsy. The first responding police officers noted a stark discrepancy between Jason Corbett's horrific injuries and the fact that both father and daughter were unscathed, their clothes intact. Not even Molly's thin bracelet was broken, despite her claim of a life-and-death struggle. Another key observation. Some emergency responders noticed blood on the brick, and Jason's body began to dry out and he was cold to the touch, indicating a significant period of time before the emergency call was made. And why would someone keep a brick on their nightstand? Detectives questioned its presence in the bedroom. Molly explained she planned to paint the brick with the children and was examining it before bed, thinking about the design. The case hinged on appearances, the external details and testimonies of those involved. During questioning, Molly confessed she had endured years of severe abuse from her husband, keeping silent for fear of losing the children. She said she consulted lawyers who advised collecting evidence of abuse for a custody battle, leading her to plant recording devices around the house. She presented these recordings to the detectives. Tom claimed during questioning that Jason had repeatedly physically abused Molly. However, the investigation found no evidence of physical abuse during Molly's life with Jason. At the trial, the defense insisted on self-defense. Jason Corbett was portrayed as a drinking, violent man who emotionally and physically abused his family. The defense even found people suggesting he might have killed his first wife, Meg. The family doctor testified about Jason's complaints of mood swings. He felt he was getting angry recently without reason. Social workers interviewed the children. Jack and Sarah said their father was always angry and even hurt their mother. The prosecution presented expert reports, indicating that while the audio recordings made by Molly showed Jason's temper, they did not evidence physical violence. Toxicology reports also found traces of a psychiatric medication prescribed to Molly in Jason's blood, suggesting this may have caused his mood irregularities. Jason's family, who knew him as a calm and kind man, were shocked by the defense's claims and insisted that Molly fabricated the story and likely drugged him with illegal drugs to cause behavioral instability for her records. A bloodstain pattern analyst called by the prosecution testified that the blood spatter trajectory did not match a self-defense scenario. The attack on Jason began while he was getting up, and he was defenseless, lying face down when he was repeatedly struck. In 2017, Molly and Tom were found guilty of murder and sentenced to 20 to 25 years each in prison. 
They filed an appeal a week later and eventually succeeded in getting the North Carolina Supreme Court to overturn their second-degree murder conviction in 2021, leading to a new trial. They were released on $200,000 bail, leaving Davidson County Jail within an hour of each other. In October 2023, father and daughter made a plea deal for involuntary manslaughter. During the November trial, statements from Jason Corbett's now-grown children, Jack and Sarah, living with their aunt in Ireland were heard. 17-year-old Sarah Corbett stated that defense witnesses and attorneys distorted her words when she was eight to aid Molly Corbett and Tom Martins in obtaining lighter prison sentences. Molly Martins taught me to shoplift, vomit, and lie. She used to hit my brother and starve him. When I was just five, she told me my father killed my mother. I really loved Molly, and she manipulated me. Jack Corbett confessed in his statement that he lied to investigators when he was 10. I lost so much of myself since that day. My words were used as a weapon to help Molly and Thomas avoid punishment for killing my father. I never saw my father harm Molly. He was a loving and honorable man, and they did everything to tarnish his good name. While my friends enjoy parties, I'm in therapy, learning to live with the fact that I lied and helped them get away. The children asked Judge Hall to sentence Molly Corbett and Thomas Martins to the maximum 25 years. Perhaps their plea deal helped them avoid this sentence. In November 2023, father and daughter were sentenced to a minimum of four and a maximum of six years, with credit for the 44 months already served. They were also ordered to avoid contact with the Corbett family. Thomas Martin's lawyer expects his client to be released in seven months. Sarah, with her aunt Tracy's help, wrote and published a series of children's books aimed at helping kids cope with loneliness after losing a loved one. Jack became a singer, songwriter, and skilled rugby player. Both siblings continue to fight for justice in their father's case. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to click the bell not to miss new stories from around the world. See you soon. Take care.